All right, it's 2.15, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with the Convention Center by now, but uh, for confirmation, you're in New Orleans Theater Section A. Session on the forecast looks bright, tableau forecasting. If you're wandering in the wrong room, feel free to stay. I think everyone's going to learn a little bit, some, uh, something about forecasting in tableau today. Well, my name's Isaac Miner. Um, this is my fourth year speaking at conference. Uh, I, always, I always enjoy and I get excited about talking to all, all the customers and seeing them get excited about Tableau. Uh, in the past, I've spoke on how to work with Google Analytics data in Tableau, as well as some of our data integration options, like blending and cross-database joints. Um, but today, I'm really excited to talk about forecasting in Tableau alongside my uh, esteemed colleague sitting in the front row, Josh Weyburn. We're both sales consultants on the Midwest team. Josh is located in Cincinnati, and I'm located in Chicago. Uh, a little bit about the history of this session. We've, we've been delivering it uh, in some form or fashion for the last four years, but every year it changes a little bit. Um, you know, we introduce new features, we get feedback, and one of those, those main drivers, and Josh will touch on this a bit later, is what we get back from the mobile application. You know, we really do take this, this feedback, try to alter the content, and make sure everyone's getting, getting the most out of these sessions. So two years ago, we got a, a, a bit of feedback that I wish they would have gone deeper. So we altered the content a little bit to make this more of a deep dive into all of the things you can do with forecasting in Tableau and less of an overview or a general, uh, you know, this, this is what forecasting in Tableau is all about. We also got this wonderful piece of feedback. Josh and Cass, the presenters at the time, uh, were beautiful unicorns. Uh, now, now Josh, Cass, and I are what you might call millennials, so we love this type of feedback. But we didn't make a whole lot of uh, uh, changes based on what we saw here. So this is going to be more of a deep dive. And there's really two ways we can approach a, a deep dive into forecasting with Tableau. We can either you know, get a running start, close our eyes, and cannonball into to multivariate forecasting with R and Python. Or we can you know, dip our toe into the shallow end, talk about some of the things you can do natively in Tableau with calculations and our drag and drop forecasts and slowly move into some of those external services. We're going to take that, that latter approach. I'm going to take up the first half of this, this presentation talking about forecasting features in Tableau. And then Josh is going to spend the second half getting a little bit deeper talking about the external service connections that, that you have available to you in Tableau. Now, two quick forecasting stories before we get started. Um, this is a picture of my dad and I at Arlington Park, uh, a racehorse track just outside of Chicago. I grew up in a small town called Ripon, Wisconsin, which is about a three hours drive north of Chicago. And we'd often come down to the racetrack and, and, and bet on the horses. So I was, I was getting ready for this presentation and it occurred to me that betting on horses is just some really effective short-term forecasting. Right? You take some inputs, you pick the horse that's gonna win, play, show, uh, you collect your money. But has anyone been to the horse racing track and, and opened up one of those programs and, and, and tried to decipher and, 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 you know, looked at those inputs? This is what it looks like. This is for one horse for one race. There's about eight of these, uh, you know, races all day. And this is the data that's supposed to help you forecast who's going to win the race. You know, as, growing up, I thought you just picked the horse, but it turns out there's data behind each of these horses and lots of it. But it's difficult for you know, the, the casual uh, horse, horse race uh, better to decipher, is this a favorite, is this a long shot? Uh, I can gather the, the name so far off of this. Here's a picture of my dad running his forecasting models. Um, they also have this qualitative inputs. The, you see that orange turf master. That, that's basically expert picks. They make the picks for you. Of course, that costs a little bit extra, uh, as well as some of those expert picks in the, in the programming. So that's, that's more of a qualitative input for the forecast you're trying to make about who's gonna win the race. So we did all right, we, you know, we cashed a few tickets, uh, but needless to say that forecasting was difficult, even with all that data. Now the next story, this is more quantitative. When people think of forecasting, they also think of the weather. You know, what am I gonna wear? Is it going to rain? Is it safe to go outside in Chicago when the wind chills 20 below? Any good piece of forecasting is gonna help you decide what to do in the future. So I was lucky enough at a young age to be introduced to a pretty complex weather forecasting model. Um, in fact, it was one of my jobs, my first jobs as a teenager in Ripon, Wisconsin, to make sure that this forecast 
was delivered to millions of people across the US. A little bit about that forecasting model. It's 80 to 85% accurate. It uses a top secret mathematical and astronomical formula. It uses sunspot activity, tidal action, and planetary position to predict the weather. And they can do so up to two years in advance. It's pretty impressive, right? Well, here's where I worked. This is a printing press at Ripon Printers in Ripon, Wisconsin. And they printed a version of this, the Farmer's Almanac. Uh, anyone here familiar with the Farmer's Almanac or the, the long range weather forecasting? Go ahead, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Now also keep your hands up if you're a little skeptical about that, uh, that weather forecast, or that, the, the attributes going in there. Okay, a few skeptics in the crowd. Well, it turns out there are some other skeptics. In fact, this meteorologist from Penn State said the ability to predict events that far in advance is zero. Can't do it. Um, you know, what about tidal action? What about planetary position? What about that, Paul? What about th that skeptics in the crowd? So I'm not a meteorologist, but I'm a sales consultant at Tableau and a bit of a data person like you all. So I went ahead and requested about 75 years worth of weather data for New Orleans for a weather station nearby here to see if I could predict the weather for Tableau Conference 2018 with data from two years ago. Right? Who wouldn't? Connect it to Tableau and see what I can do. So first take a look at what the Farmer's Almanac said. They predicted two years ago that the weather this week would be rainy and cool. I didn't know how this was going to play out, but that, that's pretty spot on, right? <laughs> Uh, they also predicted that the, the temperature would be a little bit above average. They're not as precise as a weather station in New Orleans. They, they kind of take this, this, this area of weather, but it turns out their, their forecast was pretty accurate. Here's mine. I, uh, I wasn't able to get down to the weekly level, but I was predicting that the max temperature would be 85, min would be 66. You can see below, that's a little bit warmer than the average for October in New Orleans. I, I as, a, you know, as a data person, predicted we were going to have a warmer uh, and sunnier Tableau conference. Turns out the Farmer's Almanac uh, you know, beat me at that forecast. So why did I tell you those two stories? Well, first, I wanted to talk about qualitative and quantitative inputs. Qualitative like the expert picks, and quantitative like all of that data I was able to collect from the National Weather Service to pr try to predict what was going to happen in the future. And second, I'm sure anyone who sat through a, you know, a high school math class or probability and statistics can relate, is that forecasting is hard. It's difficult, no matter how much data you have, to predict with any sort of you know, confidence and validity what's going to happen in the future. So how do we make that easier? Let's jump into some of the forecasting features in Tableau. All right, so I'm going to start out here with something we're probably all pretty familiar with, and that's calculated fields in Tableau. So think of a formula that you have for forecasting, uh, something you may do in Excel or some other program. With, a, with, with calculated fields, you can input that formula in, you know, run it through Tableau, and, and have an output of a forecast. So I'm going to create a view here, which is my quantity. Let's call this you know, maybe my, my call volume over time or something to that effect quantity of something I'm trying to forecast, and look at that over time. Now you'll see here that I have our actuals, if I pull this data type out. This data set actually has our actual data with that kind of linear trend up to the end of 2017, and then it forecasts what's called a naive forecast out into the future. Now a naive forecast is just what it sounds like. It takes that last data point and just pushes that out uh, as many years as, in this case, out to uh, 2030. Now, I created this data set. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, but the goal for me was just to get data in there so I can work with it in the future. So I created this forecast, this calculated field. Let's take a look at this. Now, this isn't the most complex uh, exponential forecast, but it's a good example of how you can take a formula and input it into Tableau. So here again, I have those two different data types, our actual and our forecast. This is just saying, if the data types are forecast, take that quantity, multiply it by 1 plus this hard-coded value of a 10% growth rate, divide it by the number of months in the year, 
Raise it to a power that puts less weight as you get further and further out. Otherwise, just give me the quantity. So here's a simple calculation that can give us a forecast. And now when I replace this quantity with our forecast, we can see that sure enough, we've taken that naive forecast and, and we've added some exponential growth going out into the future. Now this is great. You know, we have a, a good visual and we can start to have a conversation about what it's gonna look like in the future. But I'm sure any, any, anyone in the audience will tell you that any good piece of visualization is going to be interactive. You know, what, what's the next question? How can I make this a little bit more flexible? So the way we can do that is I've created here a growth parameter, which is essentially just a, a percentage that somebody can bump up and down by these steps of, of half a percentage. And instead of that hard-coded value of 10%, I'm just going to go ahead and put in the growth parameter. So here now you saw that forecast change, and the end user can come in here and say, well, I want to know what that would look like at an 8.5% growth rate. Or, you know what, let's, let's, let's dial that back and look at it, maybe a 2% growth rate, whatever they want to do. So this is making this forecast a little bit more interactive. You can even take this a step further. You know, what if somebody says, hey, I'd rather see, I want to see a couple forecasts. I want to compare one against the other. I want a kind of a high uh, stretch goal, and then what, what's more of a conservative uh, estimate? So I'm going to duplicate this forecast. Edit this one to call it my high forecast. Create another parameter called high growth parameter. And go ahead and show this one as well. So here I'll drag out this high forecast, get these both on the same axes, and now somebody can go ahead and dial this other one up and now we can start to compare what a high forecast would look like compared to maybe a lower one. So again, this is great. This is, this is a forecast based on a, a formula that you may have had or may, that you may run, uh, and it's visualized pretty nicely in Tableau with some interactivity. But how do I know that I selected the right model? How do I understand the validity of, of the forecast I just put out there? What if I take this to my data science team and they say, hey, we need, we need to test that. We need to understand what, how, how good that forecast model is. I would have to take this forecast data out of Tableau, run it through some models, uh, and, and crank out some, some metrics to understand, is this, a, is this a good forecast? Is this a reliable forecast in the future? So let's transition now into some of the forecasting features native to Tableau. Here we'll use the good old Superstore data set and look at our sales over time by month. Let's fix, fix these. Come on. There we go. So here's our sales by month. I'm going to pop over to this analytics tab and drag out a forecast. So this is great. I show a lot of people this as I'm demonstrating pro the product, and a lot of customers will say, you know, so what? Tableau can make a forecast. What about it? You know, I can forecast in Excel. I can forecast in, in anything else. Well, it turns out there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in Tableau. When we introduced the drag-and-drop forecasting, although it's simple to add, it's by no means simplistic. You know, we consulted with some of the people who, who developed the packages in R and Python to make sure that what we're allowing business users to do, like drag and drop a forecast, was uh, you know, both valid and approachable. Um, so it turns out when you drag out that, that forecast, uh, Tableau runs eight models behind the scenes using what's called exponential smoothing. It selects the best one and, and shows that as a forecast. So let's jump into a little bit of the behind the scenes of this forecast. And the best way to do that or the best place to start is if I right click on this forecast and come into our forecasting options. So here we're going to see just some, some basic information about the model that Tableau selected. And it makes some assumptions off the bat to, to make sure that 
you know, we're giving you the best forecast based on the inputs. First of all, at the top, you can see that automatically Tableau selected the number of periods to extend this forecast, uh, in this case, 13 months. You can, you can of course, alter that. Uh, and we also see down here that Tableau's chosen to ignore that last month or that last period in our data set because Tableau assumes or, or thinks that, that that one might be incomplete, right? You don't want to forecast based on half of a month's worth of data. The other thing we can see here is that Tableau has selected that exponential smoothing model, right? And, it, and it's chosen it automatically. We'll touch on this a little bit later, but exponential smoothing needs a, a decent amount of data to, to, to create a forecast. It needs at least five periods. Um, so in this case, the level of detail is months. We have a whole bunch of months worth of data. Tableau needs at least five to generate a forecast. So let's talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and clear this sheet. We'll look at that same sales forecast, and this time I'm going to look at it at the quarterly level. And here I'm just going to take the last three points in our data set. We'll keep those only and drag out a forecast. And sure enough, Tableau's shown me a forecast. You're probably thinking, Isaac, you just told me I need five points. You selected three. What are you talking about? How did, how did Tableau give me that forecast? Well, let's go back into that forecasting option. And the second part here about data source is telling us that Tableau is actually aggregating our data at the monthly level as opposed to the quarterly level. So the level of detail of this visualization is at the quarter. Um, but Tableau is able to query the data source using information about that date, in this case, what month that, what months are, are consisted in, that, in those quarters, and still generate a forecast based on that data. If I switch this to, you know, aggregate it by quarters, you'll see that Tableau tells me the time series is too short to forecast. So again, there's a lot of things going on under the scenes, including being able to query our data at a lower level of granularity than what we see in the visualization. So I'm going to create another forecast here. We saw with sales there was some seasonality, just like you know, any, any um, sales metric. There's a lot of sales at the end of the year, near the holidays, and, and some dips in the beginning of the year. In this case, let's look at profit at the monthly level. And this has a lot more of that variability, right? There's, there's, there's a trend slightly up, but I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of seasonality in terms of when our forecasting is happening. Again, drag out a forecast. And here we kind of get that flat line extending out, like, it, you know, profit's going to continue to go up. Here I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with this forecasting model. Again, Tableau is always going to use exponential uh, smoothing as the model it, it, it selects. Um, you're not going to have the flexibility like you will with, with our external services like R and Python and MATLAB to specify the model, but you can specify some of those inputs. So here if I were to change this to custom, I see this drop down for both trend and season. And my two options, uh, in addition to none, are additive and multiplicative. So I can tell Tableau a little bit more about my data uh, if for some reason I don't like the forecast that it assumed. Now additive, you can think of that as uh, amplitude. So for instance, if you take uh, television sales, those tend to spike around Christmas and around the Super Bowl. You know, the, the, the amplitude or the amount of TVs sold during that time uh, would be an additive trend or an additive uh, season. While multiplicative, think of that as more of a proportion, right? The, the proportion, uh, say, of smartphone ownership um, 10 to 15 years ago was a lot less than it is today. You know, I'm, I'm assuming in this room it's probably upwards of uh, 90, 100 percent. So as more people continue to adopt cell phones, the more that are sold. That's more of a multiplicative trend. So I can force these. I can say, oh, you know what, I want this to be additive and additive, and oh, I like that forecast a lot better. You know, I, I was able to, to force this forecast to be a little bit more of what I, I wanted to see. But remember, forecasting is not what you think it should be, right? It's, it's based on inputs, and it's based on these models that are running behind the scenes. So it's not always the best idea to go ahead and force the trend just so it looks a little bit better. Now, another thing I want to 
to touch on is this describe forecast. And this is really, for me, where the value of, of, of the native forecasting in Tableau kind of hits home. Uh, here we can see in the summary tab is that you have some basic information about what are we forecasting, what's the, the length of time we're forecasting. And then we also see some of this information down below, like the initial value, the change from initial, the seasonal effect, as well as the contribution of trend and season. If we think back to that Excel type forecasting where I put that input in and you know, we had a result, we couldn't really tell without additional analysis whether that, that, what was the quality of that forecast, whether it was valid. And so you'll see here that Tableau gives us this kind of somewhat vague quality metric of okay or good or poor. Where's that coming from? Well, that's located here on this model section. So again, all of these were computed with exponential smoothing but here we can start to see that, yep, sure enough, I forced the trend input to be additive. I forced the season to be additive. And we see a number of these quality metrics, like MSE, M RMSE, MAE, MASE, MAP, MAPE, AIC, and then some of those smoothing coefficients. So we're not going to dig into all of these. Uh, if you want to, you can always say, I want to learn more about the forecasting models and jump into some of our documentation. But I want to touch briefly on this AIC the Akaike Information Criterion. This isn't going to tell us how good the forecast is, but this is the number, or this is the, the way that we evaluate those eight forecast models that we ran and select the best one. Basically, the one with the lowest AIC is the one that we select and the one that we're going to display for that forecasting. And then the next thing I want to talk about is this MASE, the Mean Absolute Scaled Error. This is going to relate to that quality metric that we saw in the summary tab. If it's uh, lower than four, lo lower than 0.4, it's going to say good. If it's lower than 0.8, it's going to say OK. And if it's greater than that, it's going to tell us you have a poor forecast. And we can see how that relates to, to that quality metric here. So let's just say I bring out something like subcategory, because I want to forecast for all of my different uh, lines here. And some of these have more data than others. If we look down at copiers, for instance, not a whole lot of, of, of continuous sales going on. So I'm a little bit skeptical about how Tableau is computing this forecast or if that's that valid. So if we actually come into here, we can see that Tableau is going to give us those metrics for each of them. And sure enough, for those copiers, we can see over here that it's giving us a, a quality metric of poor. And that's related to that value here we can see is right at. So this is just a, kind of a, a, a little bit of a journey into what's going on behind the scenes in Tableau and, and hopefully giving you some confidence in the drag and drop forecast that you bring out when you start to uh, you know, have a conversation about what's going to happen in the future. Now let's take subcategory off. Um, let's take this forecast off as well. Now let's say these are my actuals so far. I want to maybe go back in time to uh, you know, 10 months or so before the end of this, this data set. And let's say I'm sitting here in the beginning of the year and I want to forecast some data out. So I'll drag and drop that forecast again. And what if I want to then start to compare the forecast that Tableau is giving me to the actuals as they start to happen? Uh, well, it turns out you can actually use this forecast, even though it's just generated in Tableau. You can use this and come back to it and, and metric that against the actuals. And the way we can do that is if I just do Control A to select all the points, Control C to copy them, you can jump into a new sheet and actually just paste that data in. So we'll see here that we have a new data source on our clipboard. We'll call this our forecast. And we have some data here. I'm going to clear this sheet. And I know this is actually a date. And this corresponds with my order date. So let's again, you know, let's fast forward in time. We're looking at our profit. We are now. 10 months into the future, and now we have actuals going out uh, a little bit further. We can take that forecast, 
pull out our profit, or our forecasted profit, we'll call it, to that same axis. And now we can see the actual profit compared to that forecast and start to understand you know, how, how good did we do uh, compared to that forecast? And here we can see that in December of this last month, that forecast was much higher than, than our actual. So there are ways to not only understand the validity of that forecast model that we're running, but also take that data, uh, use it, and, and, and go ahead and compare it to your actuals as you start to move on. So hopefully this was a, a, a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit helpful for understanding what Tableau does in terms of the forecast models that are running, and also some of the things you can do with your own formulas or calculations. Uh, now I want to turn it over to Josh to talk a little bit more about some of our external services. Awesome. Thank you, Isaac. Give Isaac a hand of applause. So for those I haven't met, my name's Josh Weyburn, a sales consultant based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'd like to start today with a story about a time I used a single variable in a forecast to help predict an outcome. And the outcome didn't quite go as expected. Uh, like most parents, my story revolves around my kids. Here I have my Facebook-worthy, uh, everything is awesome picture. And then I have reality. Uh, you can see one kid's actually happy, so hey, we're 33% of the way there, we're doing good. My uh, young, or middle son is pissed off that I didn't give him a cookie, and then of course my daughter just really wants to be everyone to leave her alone. Uh, but this story revolves around my beautiful wife, Jana, and my daughter, Nora, uh, who is just about as cute in real life as she is in this picture. Um, but this goes back about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, my wife was 41 weeks pregnant, uh, done being pregnant about week 39. And so on that fateful Thursday, I was very excited when construction started. So I call up the uh, nurse, ask, you know, hey, when should we come in? We, you know, we don't want to come in too soon. And the nurse says, well, you guys are 15 minutes from the hospital. Um, you know, I really don't want you to come in too early. We might have to turn you back. And that's a, that's a terrible experience to have. So I'd wait until the contractions are about five minutes apart. Okay. So 11 o'clock rolls around, contractions are six minutes apart, so we start to get ready. Well, by the time we get out the driveway, they're four minutes apart. And by the time we get on the highway, it's three minutes apart. And we get off the highway, and they're 90 seconds apart. And I'm doing 85 miles an hour in a 35 zone, and my wife starts screaming to stop. Now, being the very attentive husband who always listens to his wife, I see the hospital's a block and a half away, and I hit the gas, we're gonna make it. And then she screams there's a head, and I need to push. So I pull over, Siri, call 911. And 30 seconds later, Nora decided to come out. I'm right there on the side of Pfeiffer Road. So I'm uh, pleased to announce everyone turned out happy and healthy. This is a week later. You can see how happy my uh, oldest is to get to meet all the firefighters. Uh, but this is the crew that actually helped us out that night. Found out the guy holding my daughter is a, a special forces in the Marines, which was a cool uh, little tidbit. But, you know, all things considered, despite having delivered in the back of a Ford Edge and literally lived out the lyrics to a bad country music song, you know, everything turned out all right. But as I've had some time to process, I, I went back and said, you know, how did I get to the point where I'm wrapping my daughter in a pillowcase I thought I was going to be sleeping on later that night? And it goes back to that conversation I had with the nurse. You know, the nurse, her recommendation was based on what she had historically seen with other women. How long did it take them to progress in their contractions? But I had a little bit more information. I had more insight. I knew this was my wife's third baby. I know that the second one came a lot faster than the first one. And I didn't quite put enough weight into some of the other factors. And very often we see this in the context of business as well. We're using a forecast or a model to try and predict some outcome and oftentimes, it's not solely based on a single variable. There's other factors we have to consider. Now, we saw with native forecasting in Tableau, it's very good, um, picks the models for you, makes it very accessible. But sometimes we need to go a little bit deeper. And so what I'd like to spend the next 30 minutes is really diving into a little bit more into that deep end of how we can do some more sophisticated modeling and sophisticated uh, forecasting in Tableau. So let's look at how this works. 
So forecasting uh, with external services was introduced in version 8.1, uh, starting with R. In 10.2, we introduced Python. And in 10.4, we introduced MATLAB. And how each of these is, works is it allows me to write、uh, either R, Python, or MATLAB code within Tableau, have that information er, processed, and then return the result of that into Tableau so I can visualize it. Now, the real benefit with, with the, using these programming languages is it gives you access to a whole bunch of libraries that do a lot of the hard work for you. So, for those who aren't familiar,、um, R is a statistical programming language、uh, used a lot with plotting. Python is a general, more general purpose language、uh, that's really easy to read and use, so it tends to be a popular one for people to learn the first time. And MATLAB is very popular for computational type things. So I used it as an engineering student with fluid dynamics,、uh, thermodynamics, those types of things. But with each of these, those libraries allow me to tap into sophisticated models without necessarily having to know those models. And because R and Python are open source, it means there's a tremendous community out there that allows me to get up to speed quickly. So, with,、um, let's talk a little bit about how this works within Tableau. So, within Tableau, I have the ability to write a script function, and we're going to see what that looks like. And that script function does two things. One, it's going to actually have the R, Python, or MATLAB code in it.、Um, and then it's going to tell me or allow me to pull data that I've connected to in desktop. That I can then run through that forecast. It's going to grab both that input data in the script, pass it to an external service, which is just a process running either locally on your machine or on another computer somewhere.、Uh, if it's R, you're going to use a package called RServe.、Uh, if Python, you'll use something called TabPy. And with MATLAB, you'll use something called MATLAB Server. Now, what that process will do is it's listening for Tableau to send it that code. It's going to take the code, take the data, Process through that with the libraries you've installed, and then it returns the result of that into Tableau that Tableau can then use to visualize. So let's look at those script functions before we jump into our demo. So the,、uh, there's four different types of those script functions there's an int, string, Boolean, and real. And this is just specifying when that external services returns the data into Tableau, how do you want to treat it? What type of data do you want to treat it as? The next is where we're actually putting R, Python, or MATLAB code that will be executed. And then lastly, we're defining all of the data or、uh, parameters that we want to send. Now, those will get referenced in order.、Um, so the average of data one will show up as .arg1, and that actually gets put into the R code. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a moment. But using this、uh, function, this is a, a calculated field that I now can drag and drop just like any other、uh, measure in Tableau. So let's go ahead and jump into the demo. All right. To start, we're going to look. This is Johnson Johnson's earnings、uh, data going back from 1960 up until 1980. Now, if I'd like to make a forecast, I'm just going to drag out my date. And my forecast. And then I'll go ahead and color that so we can see. So, what we can see now is we've got a forecast coming back that's now taking this out to 1983. And I've actually created a parameter with that. So, if I want to say go out to 1984, I can just increase my periods to forecast. And now we're going out to 1984. So let's look at that calc to see how we did that. All right. So here we've got the script real. So that's telling Tableau I'm going to be calling a external service and pulling back the result of that as a real number. Here I'm defining the library of that forecast. If you're not familiar with this, think of libraries as a set of functions like I'd have in Excel. So concatenate, vlookup, min, max, those are functions that a library would contain that allow me to run those things. Uh, the other thing I've done in here,、um, I've got some print statements, which we'll get to here in a second, that allows me to debug.、Um, but here is where、I'm, I have my sum of earnings down here. And because it's first, that shows up as .arg1. So when this code runs, it knows to take the values of sum of earnings and execute them accordingly. 
And then periods to forecast shows up here in dot args too. And then here is where we're actually using the forecast function. Um, so I don't have to know how this function works or how this model works. I just have to write the code around it, pass it the right information, and then it returns the result of that. And then、um, what we, I'll go back to this. What we see here is、um, with these print statements, what I can do is right now I'm in R Studio. So R Studio is just an application that allows me to run R code. And in order to get R serve running, all I needed to do is use the library R serve. And then this is an, a, a bit of R code that just runs that、uh, particular function. So once I have this running, I can then tell Tableau. I can tell Tableau where to look. So, in my, if I go to help and my settings and performance, manage external services. So, this is where I'm telling Tableau Desktop hey, you've got R serve running, it's on my local machine, and this is the port that it's running on. Now, in, when I see this deployed to、uh, organizations or enterprise, oftentimes this is running on a server somewhere. And so there might be a, you know, this is tabpy.server or rserve.server、uh, that you'd be connecting to that someone has running somewhere else. And then what we also see,、uh, get out here, is in rserve, because I have those print statements. Every time I run it, it's actually printing out different things、um, that, that I have running in that script. So, this is a great way if I want to see, hey, what are the sum of earnings that it's passing me? I could put that in there. Or if I wanted to see what the parameter was in this case,、um, this is where I'm seeing 16. So, a really great way to be able to troubleshoot、um, that code as you're going through there. All right. Now, some of you may be saying, well, this is great and all, but didn't we just see single variant forecasting in Tableau? Absolutely. So let's go take it a little bit further. We'll start looking at some multivariate forecasting. All right. So, our fir first example,、um, we're looking at call volume in a call center. And this is for、um, a company that knows that during the holidays tends to get a lot more calls. And so, from a staffing perspective,、um, they want to be able to use this forecast to understand how many people do they need working that day. So, on the top, we see our blue is our call volume. Our orange is the forecast. And this, the forecast on top is using that same single, variable, or single variant library we used before. So, here we're using that same forecast library and that same forecast function, just passing it the average call volume. And we see that we catch the cyc,、uh, cyclicality. Is that a word? I don't want to make it up today.、Um, but I, I am able to capture that in the forecast, but I don't capture the spike that I see looking back. Now, the other forecast I have running here is using a different library. So this one is, I'm sorry, different function.、Um, so this one's using the same forecast, but now I'm using the ARIMA model、uh, in order to forecast. And what the ARIMA model allows me to do is factor in both my call volume and my holiday. So, that now I can take that into account. So, you can see here that in our forecast,、uh, we accurately capture when we expect to see a spike when we have that holiday on April 27th. We can take this a little bit further. So, one of the、um, most powerful things that I think,、um, let me play. There we go, let this load. One of the most powerful things、um, I see this used for is you've got a data science team or you've got some folks who know R and Python, and they build these incredible models or this predictive model, but then what do they do with it? So often it's hard for that data science team to be able to put it in a, some type of a tool or in a format that's usable for a very unsophisticated business user. And so what we can see here is、uh, my data science has built me this great、um, forecasting、uh, library. And so, what we're looking at is、um, shipment、uh, for a transportation company. And so, the, the measure we're really interested in is the delivery delay. So, when I send my trucks to those customers, if it doesn't get there within a certain time frame, I actually start getting fined for it. And so, what I want to be able to understand is try to predict if we're going to have trucks that are late. And I know there's a couple things that factor into that. So, here we have trucks per day. I know that the more trucks we have going out in a day, the likelihood of, of us being late goes up. And then I also have a bids per lane. So if I want to send something from here to Chicago, that would be a lane.、Uh, 
Uh, and then I would have all the, or the transportation uh, companies out there bid on that lane. And so what I know is if I get more bids on the lane, that's an indicator that there's more driver availability. And if there's a higher driver avail availability, I know that I'm going to um, be more likely to get that on time. So now what we can see is uh, my data science team has built me this model, but me as the end user um, who's in planning wants to be able to do some what if analysis. So I know that uh, we're expecting to see our truck spike next week, so I might want to factor in that. And I've been hearing there's a drive-in shortage, so I want to be able to look at that. So here what I can do is I can um, address, uh, adjust the trucks per day. So I'm going to increase that by 10%. And then I also have the ability I can specify for what time frame I want to be able to um, have that 10% increased in my trucks. And then I'm going to decrease the number of bids because we have less driver availability. And then I'll rerun that. So what we can see after this process is Didn't feed the gerbils this morning. I guess they're running a little slow. There we go. Um, I now can see my dark green line is my new forecast. My blue line shows me that increased demand or that increased um, trucks per day. And then um, down here shows me the drop in bids. Uh, but now I have a much better idea of what we can expect from a delay perspective and now start to put some uh, measures in place to try and mitigate that. The other thing I might want to use with a forecast is not necessarily predicting what's going to happen, but understand the result of something uh, that did happen using prior data. So here on the top, we see our, our sales volume. Here we can see on uh, March 14th, uh, we ran a marketing campaign, and we see that spike in our sales, which is great. But what would be really interesting is actually to use all of the data before that marketing campaign to forecast what would have happened had we not ran the event, because now I can be able to understand the difference. So I, I see this a lot when making any type of impl or implementation change, and you want to be able to understand, did this affect the process? This is a great way to be able to do that. So here we can see uh, we have our um, predicted sales. Let's go ahead and look at that. There we go. So here we're using a different library, Causal Impact. Uh, we're passing it the sales, the number of website hits. We know that as website hits go up, we tend to sell more. And that because we sell temperatures, as the, as the temperature goes down, uh, we see higher sales. Um, and then we're using the Causal Impact function in order to return this result. Uh, and then up here, uh, we're also, here's where we're defining the pre and post period. So the, the model is aware of what happened before, and then we'll forecast moving out. So what you get to see here is in green, we have the actual sales. There we go. We have our actual sales. In red, we have the predicted sales. And so you also get a feel uh, for how that trended along, um, you know, for the historical data. Um, and then now we can see what the gap between those two is. Now, the other thing, if I hover over, I'll just leave that up there, I think you can see. Um, I get this uh, great report that comes out that is describing what I'm seeing in this model. Uh, and this is where we see the benefit of being able to tap into some of those libraries, uh, because that uh, report is actually coming directly uh, from R. So you see in our causal impact, um, we have an impact report that gets generated as a part of that, um, that function. So I can then pull that out, pull that into my dashboard, and leverage that to better understand what's happening. This then allows me to understand what the cumulative impact of that is. So here, we're using another uh, output of that uh, library. Uh, we can see that we get to pull out the um, impact on the series. Um, by giving it the sales, the hits, and the temperature. And what that allows us to see is now as, um, over time, what's the difference or the area uh, under the curve of those two values, which allows us to say, hey, the total impact was $748,000. All right, now let's, we're going to change gears a little bit. So what I want to talk a little bit now, uh, we saw some examples of how this works. We've seen some libraries. Uh, but when it comes to app, uh, actually implementing this, uh, there's a couple things you need to be aware of. 
Now, the first thing is that when Tableau uses the script function, it treats it as a table calc. And for those who've worked with table calcs uh, in the past are aware that table calcs are highly dependent、um, on the level of detail of the view. They're done after that、uh, has been defined, and the calculations are done there. Now, what that, the imp- impact of that on, for, on when we're using the script function is that the data actually being passed to R or Python or、uh, MATLAB is only at the granularity in the view. So, for example, in our forecast we have here, I'm only sending data aggregated up to the quarter level that then R is processing. Now, why that becomes challenging is because I want to predict data into the future, but I don't have data or dates with null values in them for the future. So, there's a couple ways we can manage that. So, the first is called date shifting. So, what I can see here, we've got our、um, quarterly data and our earnings going from 1960 out to 1980. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift all of the dates,、uh, the amount that I'd like to forecast. So let me drag out my date. So what this is doing, excuse me,、um, this is just adding, it's using the data add function to add the number of periods I want to forecast in that parameter,、um, specifying a quarter to my raw data. And so, what that did for us is we now have data going from 1964 out to 1984. So, I've trimmed four years worth of data off the beginning of my data set. I'm going to paste them onto the end of the data set, null out those values, and then let、uh, R fill those in with the predicted values. So, when I go ahead and drag in my forecast now, And we'll show predicted versus actual, is where we get that forecast. And what we can see, this is the same calc we saw before,、um, but what we're doing is we're using this argument to determine、um, how long that、uh, period we need to go. And then this append function is we're actually trimming、uh, those, those first periods off and then pasting them on to the end. So, this is a great、uh, technique if you've got enough data at the beginning of your data set to be able to paste on the end. But if you don't have a long tail of, of data, you might actually start to impact your forecast by trimming some of it off. So, the second technique we'll walk through is called domain completion. So, here we have that same data going from 1960 out to 1980. What I can do now is use, domain compl- or use a、uh, calculated field. To shift that data out. So, what I'm doing here、um, is I'm running max date is a LOD calc that's just finding the,、um, the last date in the data set. And then I have, I'm doing a comparison of the raw data. So, I'm saying if this is the last date in your data set, then I want you to add the number of periods out to that date. Otherwise, just give me the raw data. So, what that looks like. Is this. All right. So here we have our original date.、Um, here we have that extended date where we can see we've just moved the last value out to 1984. What we can then do is because Tableau is aware that this is a date and that dates are continuous, I can click on the show missing values. Now, what show missing values is going to do, because Tableau is treating this as a table calc, when I send this to R, it's actually going to send null values of the missing value. So it'll send the date with, with a null value for the,、um, for the earnings.、Uh, but then, because I now have that data being sent to R, when it returns the result of that, I'll be able to see the forecast、uh, going out in the future. So now, when I drag my forecast out, And we'll show predicted versus actual. Now we get our forecast extending out to 1984, but we haven't sacrificed any data、um, at the beginning. All right, so let's go ahead and review. All right, so just a minute about what we just saw. 
So we saw in native forecasting, Tableau is doing a lot of things behind the scenes to make an educated guess for me. And what this enables is for a relatively unsophisticated business user to be able to tap into something like forecasting without having to know things about what model to choose or how to look at it. It also then gives them an indicator to say, how well can I trust this? What's the confidence or quality of it? So that I know, should I be using this or not? On the other side, we had external services. Here we saw that we can tap into the vast array of, of great work that other folks have done in the community by being able to pull in these libraries. And we're allowing for a much more sophisticated uh, forecast to be done. And what this is helping do is for, for someone who's able to write these scripts and these calculations, to be able to make the, the result of that much more accessible and much more interactive so that your everyday business users can use that. As Isaac mentioned, we, do, we really do appreciate your guys' feedback. Um, there are no participation trophies for us millennials, so all we have are your kind words. So we do, really do appreciate you guys sending that. Um, but oh, um, obviously that one's today, so that's you're not, uh, not going to happen. But in related sessions, if you're interested in unpacking a little bit more of how do you actually set this up, how do I use TabPy or RServe, uh, there's a great session that happened a or yesterday, Accelerate Your Advanced Analytics, R Python, and MATLAB. That will be available to view online. It should be around late next week. So check our YouTube channel um, and check that one out if you want to know more. But other than that, thank you guys so much. You made it to the last session. <laughs> Hope you guys had a great TC and uh, travel home safe. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, Isaac and I will be hanging around for questions or if you guys want to chat. So thanks again.